Now, it's safe to say there are absolutely tons of ultra-wide monitors out there. So why did this one in particular catch my eye? Well, let's take a look at this absolutely huge box, and that might tell us. First up, we're rocking a 144Hz refresh rate with FreeSync Premium Pro certification. Number two, it's running a 3440 by 1440 resolution. And number three, it's got a VA rather than a TN panel. And lastly, number four, it comes in at just a mind-boggling 350 pounds at the time of recording. Now I looked and I could not find anything whatsoever which had this feature set at this price or less. So I've got some pretty high expectations for this monitor, but will it disappoint? Okay, so I think we can all admit I am a not really the first company you think of when it comes to monitors. But that wasn't always the case. Back in the CRT days, Ayama were a much bigger household name. In fact, it's only more recently that they've lost a bit of that spotlight. But perhaps that might start to turn around for them with this monitor, if it lives up to my expectations, that is. Well, let's take a look in the box first. My initial impressions of this stand are actually pretty good. It's a decently sized monitor, so we're going to need a pretty beefy stand to support it. The stand is quite wide, measuring 54cm at its widest point. And it's not a plastic construction either. I'm pretty sure this is aluminium, which is good to see. At least on the bottom part anyway. The top part might actually be plastic here, but that's not really the end of the world. It's also nice to see a quick and easy design for the assembly with everything you needed included in the box. All the screws and a little screwdriver thing. The actual monitor though, well, that's where things start to get juicy. So taking it out of the packaging, it actually feels really sturdy. I mean, sure, I wouldn't want to go dropping a screwdriver on the display, but at the same time, I don't feel like the wind blowing in the wrong direction is going to end up in me RMAing this thing. Taking a look at the I.O., we've actually got a pretty good setback here. We start out with some USB 3 pass-through, which is always nice to see, and we've also got two HDMI and two DisplayPort connectors as well. I personally would like to see a DVI on here as well, but that's just me. I use a lot of older hardware which makes use of DVI, but I can appreciate that, well, 99% of IAM's target market for this thing definitely aren't using DVI anymore. We've also got the power supply built directly into the monitor, so we're not going to need any external power bricks whatsoever. We just plug straight in with a free pin kettle plug, which makes life really easy for cable management and just in general. Speaking of cable management, I would definitely have liked to have seen some sort of cable management feature on the back of the stand here, just to help keep cables looking tidy and organised behind the stand. Instead, they just look like a rat's nest. But it's certainly not the end of the world, you can always get some self-adhesive little cable ties and things just to hold them onto the back of the monitor, so really, when you're spending this much, you know, you can spend a couple more quid to get some cable ties. So in terms of adjustment, well, we've got absolutely no swivel and no pivot, unless you want to go, you know, breaking the stand. We do have the standard height adjust, which I would expect to see, and we've got a bit of tilt as well. So nothing fancy, nothing that's going to blow your mind, but we certainly have the basics covered. Getting this all plugged in and set up, it is immediately recognised in Windows and displays at the correct resolution as you'd expect. And we can also quickly enable 144Hz refresh rate in our settings. Let's take a look at the light bleed. I try to remove as many light sources as possible from the room here just to help show on the camera, but you see these lighter spots around the edge? That's not a reflection, that is light bleed around the edge of the display. When you're looking at games or websites, it's basically unnoticeable. I definitely didn't notice it. But when looking at a black screen like this, it becomes actually quite obvious. Let's go ahead and take a look at the on-screen menu though. It's definitely not a bad aspect of this monitor, I wouldn't call it a bad menu, but it's definitely not a strength. We do have a little control nipple to navigate, which is certainly my preferred input method, and it even lights up blue, which is also a nice touch. But on the other hand, some of the settings aren't necessarily the clearest. Take Overdrive for instance. If you're not aware what Overdrive is, it allows you to push the monitor's response time speed or pixel transition time in order to decrease the trailing, ghosting sort of, of fast moving objects. Here though, we have the label starting at negative 2 rather than 0. In reality, it should go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but instead we've got minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2. It, it doesn't make much sense. I also noticed this black tuner option in the OSD. 
And well, I don't know about you guys, but I think this is a pretty crap solution. As far as I can tell, this is just a terrible four or so step brightness adjuster and anything that's not the default on this setting just looks like absolute garbage. Speaking of terrible things, this monitor even includes speakers. So yep, for your £350 investment, you even get some speakers. Don't use them. I know it includes them, but don't use them. I'm sure you guys own mobile phones and I'm sure those phones came with earphones. Use those instead because they're going to sound a lot better than the speakers built into this monitor. If by some stroke of luck you have absolutely no other way of listening, I guess they'll do. By default, this monitor comes in the warm colour setting. Personally, I found this was a decent option, in fact probably the second best, but I think personally I definitely preferred the looks of the default user profile. The contrast seems better and the colours seem slightly more accurate as well. But how about we take a look at what it's like to game on this thing? because lots of my audience are gamers, and well, that's likely what lots of you will be doing on this monitor. Well, let's start off with CSGO, just because it's a good FPS game for testing out high refresh rate monitors like this one, and it's also not particularly gloomy dark game either, so we can test out the colour reproduction as well. So yeah, looking at this, these pixels aren't exactly the fastest when it comes to update time. I can definitely see some smearing going on, even though I've got the overdrive setting cranked up, so yeah, taking a look at the gameplay on this monitor, these pixels definitely aren't the fastest when it comes to update time. I can definitely see some sort of smearing going on. And it's, you know, it's not unplayable, it's just, you know, mm, not great. I've definitely seen better. Coming from an IPS monitor, I also have to admit, now that I've switched off the warm colour settings in the OSD menu, the colours here aren't too bad either. They're definitely not perfect, but I think we can see a pretty good range here. There are a couple of gaming modes, such as FPS game or sports game, etc. But you can pretty much ignore those. As far as I can tell, they just tweak the contrast one way or another and they look pretty crap. Personally, my favourite game series is Civilization, And if you play Civ or any other similar genre games, you may well love a monitor like this. Playing on the widescreen like this affords you a great oversight of your game map. So for RTS or TBS players, this is a really great option for you. That said, there are also other genres of games that work well. Simulators, racing games, anything like that really work really well and stand out on ultra-wide monitors. Unfortunately, not all games have the same luxury. AAA titles tend to handle these resolutions fine, but sometimes you'll come across the odd game that really doesn't like this resolution, especially if you play a lot of older titles. They really hate resolutions like this and end up cutting off bits of the game or giving you massive black bars. But that's not this monitor's fault, that's just how ultra-wides are in general. So what's it like to use this monitor as a daily driver? Well, there are a few things to bear in mind if you're coming from a dual monitor setup. Yes, you keep about roughly the same amount of screen real estate, but you definitely lose a lot of flexibility. When I have a dual monitor setup, I can easily play a game on one screen and watch a video on another. That's not quite so easy on ultra-wide. But that's not to say they don't have their advantages as well. Editing video on this has been absolutely great. I'm editing this video. You can just see so much more of the timeline and it really does help speed things up. You've also likely noticed by now the big old sticker on the bezel which tells us this is VESA certified HDR monitor. But it's also got a big ugly 400 next to it. 400 peak nit brightness is just so... Mm, meh, it's so disappointing. So yeah, it is technically an HDR monitor, but don't use HDR. If you use HDR on this monitor, it really is going to look dull and washed out when it's enabled. So yeah, by all means you can use it, but I definitely wouldn't recommend it. So wrapping things up, you know, I feel like I've been quite negative and, you know, perhaps that isn't fair because this monitor is actually really good. Is it the best? No. In fact, is it the best at anything? Mm, no. Again, probably no. But is it possibly the best value monitor? You know, I think there might be an argument to be made for that. I couldn't find any other monitor whatsoever which had this feature set anywhere near this price point. If I had to summarise in one sentence, I'd have to describe this monitor as the jack of all trades, but the unfortunate master of none. But it definitely gets my recommendation. It's a great monitor and I'm going to be really sad when I have to send it back.